Good evening. In the coming months and hopefully years, this show is going to bring you information that is not available to the public, ladies and gentlemen, in any form. We will be a force for education of those who really have trouble understanding what's happening in the world, in our country, in our states, in our cities, and yes, even in our families. But we have to start somewhere, and there are two things that are absolutely required in the coming weeks and months for you to understand what's happening on this show. Because I'm not going to take one single second of precious time to recount my history or how I got to be here or anything else. I'm going to start right off the bat with an education for those who for many years have been living literally in fantasy land. The real world is much different than you have ever perceived it. For years I've been traveling around this country lecturing to the American people with a great faith in my heart that once they understand the real truth of the world they will wake up, take back their power and save this great nation. And that really brings us to tonight's subject. Since this is the first show ever of the hour of the time, and the time is our time, this time, this hour, is the hour in which we will decide the future of ourselves, our family, our city, our state, and our nation. The two texts are a book entitled Behold a Pale Horse, written by me, William Cooper. It's 500 pages of the most well-documented suppressed information that's ever been printed in the history of the world. This book is $24. Postage and handling is included. And you may write to the following address with your check or money order to purchase this book. Send it to Stan Barrington, B-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N, -R -R Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona. Verde is Spanish for green, spelled B as in Victor, E-R-D-E. -E. The zip code is 86322. That's Stan Barrington, Post Office Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. You can call Stan also at area code 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. The other text for this program is the Constitution of the United States of America and the Articles and Amendment Thereof. You are going to get that document tonight on this program because without a knowledge of the Constitution of the United States of America, you cannot listen to this show and understand what is being said. You can't understand where we're coming from or what it is that we're trying to do. In fact, without an understanding, a knowledge of the Constitution of the United States of America, you really don't know anything about your own country. For you see, ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America is and resides within only one place, and that place is the Constitution of the United States of America and the Articles and Amendment thereof. There is no other United States of America. You can't find it by picking up a handful of dirt or crossing a border or talking to people are standing within a geographical area. All of the rights, the freedoms, everything that we hold dear about this country, and I mean everything, literally, resides within that document. The United States of America will cease to exist and vanish from the face of the earth if that document is destroyed if it is changed, 
if it is burned, if any of those things happen, this country, likewise, will be changed, burnt, destroyed, shredded. Most Americans have either forgotten that fact or they were never taught that fact to begin with. The Constitution of the United States of America and the Articles and Amendment thereof are the United States of America. There is no other United States of America. That is why things are happening today that people don't understand. Everywhere I go throughout this great nation, people approach me and say, Bill, I know something is wrong. I can feel it in my gut. I don't know what it is, Bill. Please tell me what is wrong. And the first question I always ask them is, do you own a copy of the Constitution of the United States of America? And I have to tell you, folks, nine out of ten replies are in the negative. In other words, no, they don't own one. On many instances, when I am attacked because of my political views, I always ask the question of the person who's doing the attacking because they don't understand who they are or what I'm all about because I only have one political viewpoint, and that is constitutional. I love this country, and this country is the Constitution. And I have sworn to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I did that when I went into the service of my country, in both the United States Air Force and the Strategic Air Command, and in the United States Navy, where I served with the Office of Naval Intelligence. I always look at these people who don't seem to understand. They think that if you love the Constitution that you're a right-wing extremist. In reality, folks, if you love the Constitution, you are an American, and you're the only American. People who don't understand that don't even know what country they live in, and all you have to do to expose them is ask. Tell me. What does the third article of the Constitution of the United States of America say? I've never had an answer yet. You can ask them any article. And in a recent poll of all those asked if they knew what the Bill of Rights was, only 33% of all those polled could answer correctly. That is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, that our country is in serious trouble today. That is the reason that everyone feels in their gut that something is wrong, but they don't know what it is. Because if you don't know what your rights are, if you don't know what your country is, if you don't understand the Constitution and know it well, backwards and forwards, inside and out. And it's a short document, folks. It's a very short document. It's easy to learn. But if you don't know those things, then it is easy for your freedoms to be taken away, for your country to be changed in a direction that makes no sense to you, for you to lose your protection under the law, for you to end up in court thinking that you're in a constitutional court but ultimately finding out that you are in an admiralty court and you have no constitutional rights in that court. All of these things are happening in America today. All of them and more. Fact. The fourth article and amendment to the Constitution, one of our primary rights under the Bill of Rights, under the first ten amendments, for all intents and purposes, is gone. And you all have watched it happen right under your noses on programs like Cops, Top Cops, Detective Cops, 911 Cops, Lady Cops, SWAT Cops, Cop Cops, Grandma Cops, and you haven't said a thing about it 
On the contrary, I have watched entire living rooms, couches full of people, families, applaud these wrongs in the name of getting the crime and drugs off the streets. You see, those of us who have served in the intelligence community know where the drugs come from and what they're all about. We also know what it was designed to do. The war on drugs is not a war on drugs, ladies and gentlemen. It's a war upon the Constitution of the United States of America. The fourth article and amendment gives us the freedom, the protection, the right to safety and to be secure in our person and in our papers and in our belongings. And it guarantees that no cop from any precinct or any ward or any police station can just come in off the street, bash down our door, rip open our mattresses, search our person and our closets, tear up our floorboards just because he doesn't like us. No, the Constitution specifically states, as you will hear, that there must be a warrant issued. It must be signed by a judge. And it must be issued upon probable cause. It must name the exact location to be searched and the exact articles to be seized. The Constitution also gives us protection against the seizure of our private property because it states that no property shall be seized without just compensation. However, every Friday and Saturday night, you all sit there in your chairs and you watch all of these things being violated. Police breaking down doors without identifying themselves. They rush in, they rip the house apart, they search everything. It's against the Constitution, the basic rights, freedoms guaranteed to us in this country. The reason why you allow it to happen and you cheer them on is because they're doing it to minorities, blacks, what some people would call poor white trash, minorities, Haitians, Puerto Ricans, Hispanics. And because you're basically racist at heart, you say, get those suckers, throw them in jail. What you don't understand, though, is when you take away the rights of any single one of us, any one citizen in this entire country, you have taken the rights of all. And by your passive acceptance, after you have been shown what is happening, you establish the law again in the common law that you no longer have those rights. That is a legal fact, ladies and gentlemen. If you do not stand up and claim your rights the moment you see them violated, it can be construed in law that you no longer are entitled to those rights. That's the reason they're showing you on television constantly. Constantly. So that they will have a legal case to say that the American people accepted it. And by their passive acceptance, they have, in effect, changed the law and have no rights. Wake up. Please wake up. There are those who want to take it all away from us. And they want to establish what they call a new world order. A one world totalitarian socialist government wherein each of us will be controlled on a 24 hour a day basis and will in fact be chained to a computer in a system of cashless debt which will be more cruel than any prison that has ever been built. But that's a subject for another program. Tonight, as I promised you earlier, I'm going to give you something. Something many of you have never had. 
something that you felt was missing in your life, and that is a reason to live. A reason to keep going no matter what, a reason to fight, a reason to do anything that you need to do. Hope, the understanding of what you are and what your roots are and what this country is all about. I give you, ladies and gentlemen, now your country. This is your country. Record it, listen to it, play it over and over again. Ladies and gentlemen, the living constitution of the United States of America. To carry on the war of independence, and hence to secure their unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The 13 American colonies banded together in 1776 as the United States of America. When the war was finally won, the new nation was confronted by many grave responsibilities. And it was soon realized that a strong federal government was needed to represent the mutual interests of the states and protect the rights of individual citizens. In 1787, delegates from the states met in Philadelphia to draw up a constitution adequate to the needs of the Union. The 55 delegates included such men as Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and George Washington. It took them four full months to complete their task. Yet, in retrospect, that was a remarkably short time. For what these dedicated, far-sighted men achieved was nothing less than a permanent framework of government, a unique pattern for a democratic way of life. From that long ago day to this, the Constitution of the United States has been the living heart and spirit of our nation abridged and amended from time to time according to the will of the people, its broad concepts ever subject to interpretation in the light of changing conditions. This great document is today as it was in 1787, mankind's most inspired design for the self-government of a free people. Supreme Law of the Land, the living Constitution of the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The first three articles of the Constitution provide for the three branches of the federal government, legislative, executive, and judicial. Article 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states. No person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of 25 years and been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers. When vacancies happen in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers, and shall have the sole power of impeachment. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state chosen for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained to the age of 30 years and been nine years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state for which he shall be chosen. 
The Vice President of the United States shall be President of the Senate, but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall choose their other officers, and also a President pro tempore, in the absence of the Vice President, or when he shall exercise the office of President of the United States. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When sitting for that purpose, they shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside. And no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. The times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. Each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with a concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. Each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings and from time to time publish the same, excepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy. And the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. Neither house, during the session of Congress, shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. The senators and representatives shall receive a compensation for their services, to be ascertained by law and paid out of the Treasury of the United States. They shall in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses, and in going to and returning from the same. And for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. But the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it. But if not, he shall return it with his objections to that House in which it shall have originated, who shall enter the objections on their journal and proceed to reconsider it. If after such reconsideration, two-thirds of that House shall agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent together with the objections to the other House by which it shall likewise be reconsidered. And if approved by two-thirds of that House, it shall become a law. But in all such cases, the names of the persons voting for and against the bill shall be entered on the journal of each House, respectively. If any bill shall not be returned by the President within ten days, Sundays excepted, it shall be a law, in like manner as if he had signed it, unless the Congress, by their adjournment, prevent its return, in which case it shall not be a law. Article I of the Constitution concludes with three significant sections. The first of these sets forth the powers of Congress and is the basis of most federal legislation. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. To pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. To borrow money on the credit of the United States. To regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. To establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. To coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin. And fix the standards of weights and measures. To provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States to establish post offices and post roads, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations, to declare war, to raise and support armies, 
But no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. To provide and maintain a navy. To make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. To provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections and repel invasion. To provide for organizing, arming and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. Reserving to the states, respectively, the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. To exercise exclusive legislation over such district as may become the seat of the government of the United States. And to exercise like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts and other needful buildings. And to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. Having granted these powers to the federal government, the Constitution next imposes limitations to protect certain fundamental rights of the people. The privilege of the right of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census. No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States. And no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, Accept any present, emolument, office, or title of any kind whatsoever from any king, prince, or foreign state. The last section imposes limitations on the powers of the states. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, or grant any title of nobility. No state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports, except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state or with a foreign power or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Article 2 provides for the executive branch of the government. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years, together with the vice president, chosen for the same term. Each state shall appoint a number of electors, equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. No person except a natural-born citizen shall be eligible to the office of president. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. In case of the removal of the president from office or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president and the Congress may by law provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the President and Vice President. The President shall, at stated times, receive for his services a compensation, 
which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected. And he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them. Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. And he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. And he shall nominate, and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States, whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. The President shall have power to fill all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. He shall from time to time give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses, or either of them. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, and shall commission all the officers of the United States. The President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 3 provides for the judicial branch of the government. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may, from time to time, ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior, and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made, or which shall be made under their authority. To all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state or the citizens thereof, and foreign states, citizens or subjects. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trials shall be held in the state where the said crime shall have been committed. But when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. <laughs> against the United States, 
shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have power to declare the punishment of treason. Following the provisions for the three branches of the federal government, the Constitution next establishes the mutual obligations and responsibilities of the states to each other and the relationship that exists between the states and the federal government, guaranteeing certain rights to the citizens of each state. Article 4. Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts records and judicial proceedings of every other state. And the Congress may, by general laws, prescribe the manner in which such acts, records and proceedings shall be proved, and the effect thereof. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. A person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crimes, who shall flee from justice and be found in another state, shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislature of the states concerned as well as of the Congress. The Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. <laughs> Article 5. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Article 6. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. The senators and representatives before mentioned, and the members of the several state legislatures, and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall, shall be, be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. It was a truly inspired design of government that the Convention of 1787 created and yet, as many of the delegates were aware, it had one basic weakness. The Constitution was not explicit enough about the rights of individuals. Time and again in the state conventions to which the Constitution was submitted for approval, the need for additional safeguards was urged. In the case of several states, ratification of the Constitution resulted only after assurances were given 
that these safeguards would be provided by early amendment. This was the first order of business of the first session of the first Congress of the United States. In September of 1789, the Congress submitted to the states a group of proposed amendments which would protect and preserve certain fundamental rights of the people against encroachment by the newly created federal government. These proposed additions to the Constitution were known as the Bill of Rights, a name which has lasted through the ages and become a living symbol of democratic free government throughout the world. As ratified by the states, these are the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Amendment 3. No soldiers shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Amendment 4. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war and public danger nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Amendment 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial, by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which districts shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. To be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Amendment 7. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed twenty dollars, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. Amendment 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Amendment 9. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Amendment 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Seven years after the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution, another amendment was ratified. This limited the powers of the federal courts in dealing with matters primarily of concern to the states. Amendment 11. The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. In 1804, the procedure for election of the president and vice president was clarified by amendment. Amendment 12. The electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, 
one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. And they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president, and of all persons voted for as vice president, and of the number of votes for each. Which lists they shall sign and certify, and transmit sealed to the seat of government of the United States, directed to the president of the Senate. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and the House of Representatives, open all the certificates and the vote shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes for President shall be the President. The person having the greatest number of votes as Vice President shall be the Vice President. But no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of President shall be eligible to that of Vice President of the United States. Then, for three score years and one, the Constitution proved reasonably adequate to the needs of the expanding nation. This was a period of great national growth, marked by the admission of 19 new states to the Union, and more than a six-fold increase in the nation's population, from 5 to 32 million people. It was also the period when the Union was rent and torn by the war between the states. In the aftermath of that war came the three Reconstruction Amendments. The first of these is Amendment 13. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 14. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The Congress shall have power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Amendment 50. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. 43 years passed, until in 1913 the power of the federal government to tax incomes was assured by Amendment 16. The Congress shall have power and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. The same year, a significant and fundamental change was made in the method of selecting senators. They had previously been chosen by the state legislatures. Amendment 17 provides for their direct election by the people. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, elected by the people thereof, for six years. shall have one vote. When vacancies happen in the representation of any state in the Senate, the executive authority of such state shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies, provided that the legislature of any state may empower the executive thereof to make temporary appointments until the people fill the vacancies by election, as the legislature may direct. The problems and pressures of World War I changed the thinking of people everywhere. In the United States, two controversial amendments to the Constitution were proposed, fervently argued, and ultimately ratified. Amendment 18, which prohibited the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquors, was subsequently repealed. Amendment 19. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. 
The Congress shall have power by appropriate legislation to enforce the provisions of this article. In 1933, the need for two more amendments was recognized, and they were enacted by the people. Amendment 20 modernizes certain of the Constitution's original provisions to bring them in line with the realities and requirements of the 20th century, and thus provide for a more efficient functioning of the federal government. The terms of the President and Vice President shall end at noon on the 20th day of January and the terms of senators and representatives at noon on the third day of January. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year. And such meetings shall begin at noon on the third day of January, unless they shall by law appoint a different day. If at the time fixed for the beginning of the term of the president, the president-elect shall have died, the vice president-elect shall become president. If a president shall not have been chosen before the time fixed for the beginning of his term, or if the president-elect shall have failed to qualify, then the vice president-elect shall act as president until a president shall have qualified. And the Congress may by law provide for the case wherein neither a president-elect nor a vice president-elect shall have qualified, declaring who shall then act as president or the manner in which one who is to act shall be elected. And such person shall act accordingly until a president or a vice president shall have qualified. Then, for the first and only time in history, an amendment to the Constitution was nullified by subsequent amendment. The 18th Amendment and the so-called Volstead Act, which had established national prohibition, were repealed by Amendment 21. But at the same time, the people extended to the states complete authority to restrict at their option the sale of alcoholic beverages. Amendment 21. The transportation or importation into any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery or use therein of intoxicating liquors in violation of the laws thereof is hereby prohibited. In 1951, following Franklin Roosevelt's precedent-shattering four-time election as president, the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution was passed. No person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice and no person who has held the office of president or acted as president for more than two years of a term to which some other person was elected president shall be elected to the office of the president more than once. On April 3rd, 1961, the 23rd, and as of now, the last amendment to the Constitution went into effect, which for the first time authorized residents of the District of Columbia to participate in the election of the President and the Vice President of the United States. The district constituting the seat of government of the United States shall appoint in such manner as the Congress may direct a number of electors of President and Vice President equal to the whole number of senators and representatives in Congress, to which the district would be entitled if it were a state, but in no event more than the least populous state. They shall be in addition to those appointed by the states, but they shall be considered for the purposes of the election of president and vice president to be electors appointed by a state. And they shall meet in the district and perform such duties as provided by the 12th article of amendment. The Living Constitution of the United States supreme law of our land. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being my very special guests on this occasion of the very first broadcast of the Hour of the Time. I am your host, William Cooper. We will broadcast this show every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night from 9 until 10 p.m. 
Central Time by satellite on SpaceNet 2, Channel 7, 7.5 audio. If you would like to inquire about available videotapes, my book, and other information, call Stan Barrington at 602 567 6109 or write to Stan at Post Office Box 889. Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Good night, and God bless you all.